Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. This is part three of a Building Your Business series and today I'm joined by my friend Ian Paget. And hey. Ian and I um, had a great conversation about three weeks ago, within a month I think. Mm -hmm. And it was such a good feed into, I, today was supposed to be like a rapid recharge or off, but I was like, I gotta have Ian back on. Because mm -hmm. after the show, we started talking and we talked for like an hour and a half extra <laughs> and we talked about some of the struggles that he's had which i think as, as a business owner you go through struggles but sometimes it's personal stuff that you can't even get to the get to the struggles that the business is is giving us so i'm excited we're going to dig into to that we're also we did not get we got half of our questions answered last time so we're going to dig into the rest of those questions today but i really i'm going to start with some of those personal things because i i really do believe that that's one of ian's great strengths is his ability to be vulnerable and share those things and he also is very willing to help other people he has a great heart for that so just so you know ian we have uh david gallo he's also in uh he's in seattle so amy Hello. i've already said hey to a bunch of y'all but i'm going to go ahead and say it again amy from north carolina is live with us amy lyons um and ford from virginia jason frostholm from mobile landon you got to remind me where you're popping in from because I can't remember. Uh, Matt Stevens is from South Carolina, right on the border. And Mara uh, is also coming in. McDonald, Mara McDonald is coming in from North Carolina. Uh, from Landon's from Maine. Mm -hmm. So, and Doc Reed is from Charlotte. Anyway, Carol Ann's from Seattle area. She lives in a tiny little island. Anyway, okay, back to you. And we're going to just get started. Ian, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. It's good good to uh, see everyone here again. <laughs> I know. Anyway, all right. So I'm so glad that we had this really long conversation last time. Mm -hmm. So after the interview, um, you were really open and honest about some of the things. Um, there were some, I think, maybe debilitating parts of that you just were very fearful about. Um, and, and they really held you back. And then mm -hmm. you, but one of the things you did, you just went face forward right into them on fixing them, which I thought was so bold and so courageous because I think a lot of people really do just hold back into what's comfortable and they avoid, right? Mm -hmm. So you talked about specific things that you were fearful of and how you overcame them and are continuing to overcome them, which one was last time it was your first video interview which I was actually my third one. <laughs> Yay. So you've scheduled plenty since mm -hmm. anyway. So mm -hmm. I think again, you are not holding back. You are, you don't shy away from, from a challenge. And I think a lot of these are internal challenges, which I think is really great. Can you kind of take us back through that for, for anybody who wasn't here live last time, kind of okay. what started it and maybe how it was when you were working at your job and what really like, signaled it to well, you as okay. a problem um i would say it's been a problem from quite a young age um like i i physically remember um quite early on in my life when i actually started to get quite anxious um and it was probably about the age of eight and i remember having to do this um school presentation uh like a pantomime and i had one line <laughs> And uh, what, basically what happened, um, all of the planning and preparation and everything like that, I was very confident. And uh, I basically needed to stand up in front of all of the mums and dad, dads and say this one line. And uh, I started to um, develop this habit of swallowing the entire time because I was dreading it. And like the first time I went up, my voice just went, I don't know, it just went weird <laughs> because my throat was so dry and um, that kind of started to develop this like ongoing anxiety. So as I grew older, I hated doing any form of presentation. So I started to avoid these situations. But it's really hard as a designer <laughs> to avoid doing presentations. Well, exactly. That's, that's what I mean. As a kid and as a teenager, you can get away with avoiding these things. And as I got older, obviously avoiding things your entire life, like even um, you know, going on the school bus and asking for a ticket, 
I used to just get to a, into this terrible habit of just putting the money down because obviously the driver knew that I needed to go to school and I didn't even speak to the driver. So, you know, growing up, I developed, um, I become quite anxious about speaking to people. Um, any form of presentation, you know, even talking to a group of people like I am now, even just like five years ago, I, I would never have considered doing something like this. You know, it's, it's been a, a gradual progression of, of improving. So, yeah, so I kept trying to, I, I would basically take sick days anytime we needed to do public speaking at school. Um, I just hated it. I just felt sick. I would shake a lot. I would be panicking about it the entire week. Um, I, I pretty much have a panic attack up there on the stage, just like saying one word and then swallow the next one. It was just embarrassing and it never went well. But anyway, you can avoid it at school, but when you actually start going into work, um, I also had this stutter as well. So on certain words, if I, know, if I started to think I can't say this word, I just couldn't say it. <laughs> So it got in your uh, head. It was so much controlled by what you were telling yourself. Yeah, I think with anxiety, you become very inward thinking. And mm. if you start, you, you, you just start overthinking all of these situations. And when they actually happen, you just, it just becomes so overwhelming. And um, it, it becomes very hard. So... Um, yeah, as I went into work, I, it became a real problem. Um, I had to say people's names. Some of them I stuttered on. I really struggled to say certain people's names. Um, anytime I needed to do a group presentation, it was I'd be panicking about it the whole week. Anytime the telephone ring, I'd feel sick. Um, sometimes I just really struggled on the phone. So um, it was obviously a problem and it was you know, really getting in the way of um, my life in general. So um, there, there was a mixture of things. So I, I had this problem where, may, mostly with public speaking, that's always been my greatest fear. And then um, uh, the stutter that got worse. And um, I also had this problem where if I'm in a group of people and had to hold it like a glass, I'd start just, if I, if I needed to drink, I'd literally spill it all over the place. So I just used to, if you, if I had to do something like a toast to someone, I would literally just put the glass down. So I thought, um, it's probably about six years ago. I thought I got something wrong with me, that all these different things are connected. Um, I was thinking maybe there's something wrong with me psychologically and it's connected to some of the things that happened when I was a child. And uh, I, I thought I, I should go and see the doctor. So um, I went in for a checkup and because I needed to register a new uh, a new doctor and um, I started to speak to them about these problems and they diagnosed me with social anxiety um, which I understand is quite common but it wasn't something I was aware of at that time they um, gave me details of um, something that's free on the NHS in the UK called talking therapies so I, um, I ha had a few sessions with this um, guy and uh, went through um, like I, I always imagined that therapy was like lying down on a bed and I literally was expecting them like tell me about your mother and <laughs> get all this stuff and you know to um, maybe give me some tablets and like everything would be great <laughs> but it doesn't it, it doesn't work like that at all like um, uh, anxiety and um, you know um, a lot of the problems that I had um, because they were so embedded from my childhood. I mean, they started about eight and it wasn't until I was maybe like 20 years later that I actually started doing something about it. So maybe like 70% of my life I had these problems. So overcoming them is a challenge. You know, like I, I remember uh, the, the shaking issue that was solved after one session. 
Whoa. One, literally one session. Just the understanding how, um, how the problem came about and coming up with a solution. It was, so basically, when I, whenever I eat something, like if it's a very watery soup, I, I literally just, my, my arm, I thought I had like something wrong with my arm and it was like locking in and just like. Right, it, it was, was shaking. It, yeah, like I'd really just shake a lot. And uh, what was causing that was that I was becoming, I, I knew that it would happen anytime I need to eat something watery or whatever. I become very inert and that's all I think about. Like nothing else is happening around me. All I'm thinking is my arm is going to shake. And the solution was to um, observe what's around me and maybe focus on the person opposite and think, you know, look at maybe like a necklace or something. Just start focusing on other things around you. Mm -hmm. And doing that, Solved it? I wasn't focused on... It didn't solve it 100% the first time, but it was a massive improvement because it just took my focus away from that. So just understanding how the brain works and having someone that can talk through it and explain um, how, how the human body works is, is um, it's really useful to understand. Like um, what, what I, what I learned from them is wait, we're basically animals and um through evolution our um animals or creatures they evolved um they they evolved for for safety so for example if in the event that you was to see a lion mm. it's it's um evolutionary beneficial that you avoid <laughs> right. so if you know you get this interaction with this lion and it's going to eat you it it makes sense that your body starts to like wire in these things into your brain to avoid that situation but in in modern day human beings it's kind of this irrelevant redundant thing but we all still have it so things like standing in front of a group of people and potentially being like mocked or destroyed mm -hmm. in some way most people don't like it because it's not safe it's a very dangerous position to be in that's why most people have um have fear so that that was useful to understand because it's useful to understand that every single person no matter who it is experiences fear in some way because it's an, an evolutionary thing so that was useful but um in terms of what cured the um the social anxiety it's still there a little it's bit the, but still, the shaking because that was a no, very the shaking, that was gone immediately but the stuttering that's been more complex i've had to do that on my own but he the guy explained the 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 the, the principles of it and he work through something called cognitive behavior therapy mm -hmm. and uh, the idea is that thoughts behavior and actions are all linked together so these three um three things your thoughts you can't really change those um your behavior you can't really change how you react because it's just like um it's kind of hardwired in you, but you, you can change your actions. That's the one thing that you have control of. One of those, I might be explaining this wrong, but one of the three you can actually physically change. So if, for example, you have a phobia of dogs mm -hmm. and you are walking down a street and you see the dog, if you have a fear of dogs, you might cross the road and then cross back and that that's basically avoiding and every time you avoid a situation it becomes worse and if you can imagine an, an arc like this each time you avoid that dog it's just getting worse and it just you know peaks and that that's how fear comes to be because you avoid these situations so me from that you know age of eight avoiding public speaking speaking to people when i didn't want to um skiving on you know just getting out of everything that's an avoidance so 
um, it had elevated that makes that it work. It, it elevates it. So mm -hmm. basically, once if you if you have the the arc and it's up here, and you have to face that fear, suddenly it's almost like um, you can you just get to the point where your heart is just racing and you can't even speak. It freezes you up. You you want to be sick. Um, it just affects your entire body. You know it can be crippling. I, I, I've been in situations where I've not been able to speak because it's just like completely overpowered me, but um, so, I've got mechanisms for, <laughs> for right? taking that now. So one of the things, do you, so I think it's really courageous and really ballsy that you just were like, okay, I'm going to, so 20 years you'd been avoiding I want to know maybe if there was a something that you were just like, I've got to fix this, but because that um, takes a ton of courage or you were just like, I'm not going to live like this. Yeah. There's, I mean, there, there's a number of different things. Um, the, the, the shaking, that was one of my big things just because I, I remember um, being at a friend's house. There's a group of us. We had to sit and I literally just, it was just the most humiliating thing ever. So I, I really wanted to, um, fix that just because it was just humiliating and I didn't want it to happen again um, but the the stuttering and um, uh, the the actual presentations I would say um, I would say that's that's quite a personal um, that like the, the the reason for that is um, when I when I my my mum she passed away like about two years ago and she had vascular dementia, so um, she needed to be in a care home. And you'd be that you'd be you go there and you, you see, and there would be these people that are at the end of their lives, and um, their memories are fading. And uh, you know, it's it's a very sad thing to see. And um, where after my mum passed away, I started to have this strange way of um, you know, looking at life that I'm gonna pass away one day and I think it would be really sad to to sit there as as a like can you imagine being like an 80 year old and and you never faced your fears you never right. you never did anything and um I just think that's sad you know being this old man and uh I started to I'm quite into science fiction <laughs> and I started to imagine like, can you imagine being like an 80 year old man and like being able to travel back in time through your body and change um, the actions? So for example, if, um, for example, you invited me to be on here, the old me would say, no, it's okay. But if the old, like if I, if I was an old man, I'd be like, oh, what if I did that? You know, I don't. I wouldn't want to regret it because what could what could of what could happen if I said yes? So um, I imagine being an old man traveling back in time, going into my body, changing the events, and um, you know, my future changing as a result of that mm. silly way of thinking. That's about a it. great. That's a great way <laughs> of thinking about it, though. And I think that was one of the things your mom gifted you with at the end yeah, of her I life. So. Yeah, because. But I mean, it that's, it takes a lot of courage. Well, to do the, the, the way that I see it is that, right, you got one shot at this. That's what mm. I believe anyway. And um, there, are, there are situations in your life which are uncomfortable, but the mm. other end of that is, mm. is greater than what it is. And mm. the worst that can happen is like, for example, on this live feed, Maybe I have a panic attack and I can't cope with it. I'll just turn off my computer and run away. <laughs> <laughs> but most people would probably understand or it doesn't really matter because I think it's better to do it. It's better to try and fail than mm. to have never tried. And if you just never try any of these things, what's the point in right. life, you know? So mm -hmm. I think I've, I've come to, I've got to the point now where I'd rather try and screw up rather than regret mm. so yeah. um kind of going steering back to the uh, question 
the the the, the uh, reason why we spoke about this originally is because of my podcast and the reason why i actually started recording podcasts was to help with my speaking and um, public speaking and stuttering and stuff like that so there was a few that i did i, I think i did maybe four episodes a few years back and it was so hard <laughs> it was so hard but um but it wasn't like you were just doing people that you knew. You were like choosing big people. No, no, this is this is something that I did on okay. my own. Okay. This, is, this is a few years ago. So what I did is I just sat down in a room on my own and pressing that record button, mm -hmm. I get those saying that flooded fear mm -hmm. and feeling sick and it was it was enough pressure to cause me to stutter. So um it helped me to like overcome uh, my speaking problems and anxiety just because I could do it in a way that if it if I screwed up it didn't matter because right. I was in, I had my own privacy here so um, that helped. Um, then mm. I didn't do anything for maybe two years and um, the the reason why I actually got back into podcasting is because I was invited to be a co-host on a show with. Um, a guy called Preston Lee. He he has a podcast on the Milo, and uh, we both found out that we run our businesses on the side. So we thought it'd be fun to do a podcast called Side Gig, mm -hmm. and um, I never did anything like that. And um, it was this was like two. Years, it was not long after my mum passed away, and when I started to think, yes, <laughs> I'm going to say yes. Um, and even though. I really struggled with that the first time we hit record. Um, those recordings are actually online, but it, it's just embarrassing because they're really bad. But doing that series with those guys, it made me feel uh, more comfortable to do something. And um, um, that's when I, you know, thought, um, everything was growing with my social media and um, community and uh, blog and everything like that. I thought maybe I can do the podcast that I've always wanted hmm. and also push myself through my phobias at the same time. So I did uh, one season and it was so rewarding. It's one of the most rewarding things I ever did in my life. You know, finishing a season, they all came out well. Um, each episode had like a thousand downloads. Um, I got a sponsor for it. Um, spoke with idols. Yeah. All of the stuff that kind of came with it was so rewarding. I decided I needed, I need to do more. And I've just, been trying to do as many podcast interviews as I can, mainly in practice. Um, but obviously, uh, doing podcast interviews is, is kind of like a domino effect. You do one, and then you do another, and then you do another, and then you do another. And then, you know, someone like Chris Doe, he uh, in, in, asks you to come on his show, and it's like, oh, this is a big deal. And then that, it, 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 they just keep opening up mm. more and more doors. So just by sitting i'm literally just at home in in my office just pushing through my fears it's um making me like semi-famous <laughs> <laughs> very bizarre you go like i've been to um a couple of events so, so far this year and it's really strange that people recognize me it's the weirdest thing <laughs> but i think that's really cool but i think you've been known just for logo geek and for for not just creating something because you like it, you wanted to, I mean, it, so your podcast is really, kind of explain what your podcast is for anybody who yeah. doesn't know. Okay, okay. so um, for a number of years, I've been building up a, I guess, a brand called Logo Geek. And um, with that, I, I run a logo design business and also um, a community and uh, so like social media feed, everything around logo design. And um, I listen to a lot of podcasts, um, but I've never really found anything um, out there specifically a about logo design. And um, I've read a lot of books, like I think, 
I think there was one I read called Tribes, something mm-hmm. like that. And, yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of tribes out there and um, every tribe needs a leader. Mm-hmm. And obviously, <laughs> I don't feel like I'm a leader, but I started to think I have um, a lot of connections. I'm actually connected with most people in the industry in some way. Um, like I started to think of all these big names and it's like, okay, I know them or I know someone that knows them and I have an audience and community and everything like that. So I thought maybe uh, I'm destined to do this. Um, so I started, um, I came up with the idea of a series where I would interview, um, people that have worked in logo design or related areas that have been there and done it so that they could teach um, the people that are just starting out. So um, it's been people like Aaron Draplin, David Airy, Jacob Cass, David Breyer, um, a lot of really big names in the industry. I had Tom Geismar as well. That was just unbelievable. Um, so yeah, I, I basically just um, interviewed them for an hour and then edit it and um, publish it out there. But what I try to do is a, a lot of podcasts that are out there, they are very chit chatty. Like mm-hmm. uh, they generally dig into the person's life a lot and, you know, they try to dig out a story from that person. But I, what I tried to do, and it was possibly by accident because I'm generally quite curious, I've come up with this um, system so that the guest comes on to answer a specific question Mm. and then we go into their life. So for example, um, what, what, when I, when planning it, I come up with all these topics and then I pick the person I think would be really good for that. Ah, Um, They answer the question and then we go into their life. Um, Some, some people I got on just because I wanted to speak to them. (laughs) Uh, you know, people like Aaron Draplin, I just wanted to spend some time with Aaron Draplin. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's talking to these uh, people that are logo designers or um, people that are into online marketing. But the idea is that anyone that listens to the podcast, they learn about logo design and um, growing their own logo design business if they wanted to. So one of the thing I love that you do is you have a lot of humility with this. Like you're a great designer and you have this, if people didn't listen to the last episode or weren't here, you have, you work uh, for your old company, the same company you work yeah, for yeah. full time. Yeah. Now you work part time Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then you do logo geek Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and mm-hmm. you have it down to a, this rhythm of you they the people you're getting people from all over the world who are coming to you to solve their logo uh challenges right it's a, a problem you're solving a design problem for them and you create their logo in a weekend right in in, in that thursday friday saturday sunday period mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. every week so that's 52 you're doing 52 possible it's not, logos a year. It. it's not like every it's not every week um i <laughs> you might get burned out by that well, if, I, kind of created this nice lifestyle business where I can work for a bit and then take some time off and go on a nice holiday. <laughs> um, so it is, it's not every week. And um, some but that's, things, you know, that, things like the podcast, the podcast has a sponsor and because it has a sponsor, I can allocate time to it. Mm-hmm. So sometimes maybe to be honest, probably next month I'll probably block out maybe three weeks to, to um, start recording the the podcast but yeah there's this nice rhythm where I'm working on um, my business and I, I do at least two projects a month at the moment I've been doing them weekly this this year <laughs> <laughs> but but that I think it's great to have time off like I think that's a great yeah, yeah. Um, another great <laughs> thing you could talk to us about is just not over scheduling your time so that you do have time to breathe right yeah yeah I well I mean one of the reasons like I, I think it's important to have a why. And uh, mm. there was a point um, a few years ago where I was just working and then I started to think about why am I doing this? You know, because just working for the sake of working without a goal is, is not really worth it. And um, 
it's a funny thing, but I got to a point in my life where I kind of achieved everything that I wanted to. And it's like, I'm, you know, in my early thirties, it's, it's a really strange thing. Cause you, 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 as a designer, you want to get in these books and these magazines and grow an audience and, um, you know, get interviewed and stuff like that. And once you kind of got there, it's not what you expect it to be. You're not like on this pedestal and everyone cheering at you. You just carry on. And, um, you know, I kind of lost my why because I like the reason why I was working hard because I wanted to reach a certain level. Um, but you, your why needs to be beyond that. And one of mine is because I want to travel. So working, it's really great because say, say like if I want to um, like travel around Asia, for example, a flight ticket is maybe only about five, six hundred pounds. It's not that crazy. And I can take on a Lego project that would pay for that in one weekend. So if I, you know, work hard for one month, I can save up the money, then the next month I can go traveling. So over the last, like, since I've been doing this, because I've got the long weekends as well, um, I've, in, in the last year, um, I've been to Thailand, I've been to Cambodia, I've been to Mexico, I've been to Miami, um, yeah, lots of different places. Um, so yeah, it's nice to kind of have this, it's kind of like a lifestyle business where I'm, I'm working on things that I'm enjoying, I'm pushing myself, I'm learning, um, I'm speaking with idols of mine and, um, the, the reason why I like to work so hard is so that I can travel and see the world and there's a never ending amount of places to go and see. <laughs> but another aspect of what I think it makes you so great is that you have built this community and you're not mm -hmm. just an overlord, you're actually involved and you respond and you, you have a really good Twitter following for sure. But then you mm -hmm. also have a Facebook group and you're there, you're present, which I think is really hard juggling everything you're juggling. But I think that that's, that to me is really impressive because again, that's you being humble and letting people also have a place to, mm -hmm. to shine. And it doesn't have to always be about Ian, right? Like you're really good about making it about other people as well. Yeah. I think I, I noticed that um, most people, brands, whatever, when they create um, something like a Facebook group, it's all like me, 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 me. And um, I think the, the, the Facebook community, that's grown quite organically. And um, I, I didn't actually plan it to, um, to, to be the way it is. So do you want some background on the reason yeah. why the community? So I like to plan long term. So I think I mentioned it last time, a book called The One Thing. And um, if you create this like somewhere out there crazy goal, you can reverse engineer back. And um, uh, long term, what I would like to do is have uh, my own book. I'd like to have training courses. I'd like to um, speak at events, have podcasts. Um, you know, th there's a whole number of different things that I would like to do long term. And I noticed that one of the overarching things was a community you know people I need people to take the training course I need people to read the books I need um you know, just everything is around people and um I've always well for the last like six years I've, I've been work working on like a twitter page and um I've always referred to my Twitter following as a community, but it's actually a one-way conversation. Like you're just tweeting stuff out. People can see it. They get back to you. And there's no um, physical interaction. And, uh, a couple of years ago, I've been a heavy Facebook user for quite a long time. That's how I connect with like friends and family and stuff like that. I rarely call or text. It's all through Facebook now, to be honest. And um, I noticed a couple of very good Facebook communities. And I was thinking, maybe I'll start a Facebook community now. And then, you know, in five years time, when I finished my book, and my training course, maybe there would be a few hundred people in there. And, um, you know, it would 
very gradually. So yeah, thinking long term, my my thoughts was I'll just create this group, um, I'll let it grow um, naturally. Um, when whenever whenever I roll out like, my podcast, I'll mention the community, and then people that listen to the podcast can come in and. I thought it would grow slowly and I'd just leave it there and people can chat and whatever. But um, I set the, the group up. Um, I've set one group up before, but I didn't really promote it and there was no one in there. So I, I closed that one. I, I started a new one. I called it the um, Logi Geek Community. Um, I, I was thinking about different names at that time. I was thinking maybe like advanced logo design group or something like that. But um, I started to just focus on what my goals were and my goals were to um, have this as part of like the Logo Geek brand. So the Logo, Logo Geek community just made sense because I got all the domains and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I don't, this was like 10 months ago <laughs> and there are, um, I can't remember exact numbers, but there's over 4,000 people in there. I think it's like 4,200. And I have nearly 4,000 people pending. Wow. Um, and I've, basically over 10,000 people have actually tried to access and enter into the group. But um, I never expected that amount of people to come in. I, um, and being totally honest, I totally underestimated the amount of work that goes into actually um, building a, a community. But um, maybe if you'd known, you wouldn't have done it. You know, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> so, so maybe it's a benefit. And Doc asked a question. He said he missed the first part of the conversation, but are you able to do this with a family as well? He's struggling to keep up with personal work and with everything. How are you doing this? And I do. I think some of it's naivete because we don't, you just got into it. But you do also have um, somebody who works for you. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, it's a, it's a friend of mine, and um, basically, when I was growing my business um, along on a as a side project, I, I, I enjoy the marketing and the just, I like, I find it quite fun to try and make my website rank on Google, or um, you know, challenging keywords. <laughs> I, I find it like a game and it's like, um, can I beat that agency to like this position <laughs> and can I build a community bigger than them? Yes, I can. Um, I find it like a game. Um, so that's fun. But the consequence of that is so many emails, like mm -hmm. from designers, from uh, clients. Um, I mean, it's not, it's, to be honest, it's not like crazy amount, but I check the stats. It's um, on average 10 emails a day come in. And um, when you, when you have, uh, you know, other commitments, I can't reply to 10 emails every evening. I can maybe reply to four or five properly, but 10, I just got to this point where it's like, I just can't cope with this. It's just too much work. And, um, yeah, I was, um, I've been quite transparent about this with like friends and family and stuff like this, that this thing I'm building is just overwhelming. There's just too much. And um, one of my friends, she works in uh, film. So um, when you work in the film industry, you might work for like six months solidly and then you don't have any work. So she really wanted some money or something. She just wanted something to do. And um I was honest and said, I can't pay you. I can't afford um, to, to pay a, a staff member. So um, she just said, oh, just a few hundred pound a month is fine. Maybe I can help you with your emails or something like that. And um, yeah, I thought it made sense. You know, it worked for both of us. And just having that weight lifted off. Literally, I just, um, I set up a separate email account. So any inbound inquiries that come in, she responds to them. I've given her template emails. Um, if there's anything she's not sure about, she'll just ping me an email going, what should I say to this particular person? But having that was just a weight off my shoulders and allowed me to kind of get back to life and just doing what I enjoy. Um, it's not always 100% perfect. Like I found when I sit down and respond to a list of emails, I get a higher conversion rate. Um, but 
it doesn't matter because what's coming in is is enough for me and that's um, taken a lot of slack off um well and it's also that you already trust her you know she was already a friend so i feel like yeah. sometimes that first hire is really difficult to do um mm -hmm. and it also has to be something that you feel exactly what you just said it's not like how i would do it but it's getting the job done to the point of yeah exactly um I, another thing that i've actually done um as an incentive to get money um i can't take on every project that comes in so using the facebook group i found a small group of people that we can pass projects over to in exchange for 20 percent of the sale so i've got um people at all different price points from like 100 pound 200 pound 400 pound 600 pound plus um at these different price points and when someone comes in and they do have these lower budgets it's like that's those lower ones is just not worth it for me to take on um i've i've got to the point now where i tend to get booked out like maybe two three months in advance so i try to push as as high as i can go so i can you know make more and work less um but these smaller projects i um, if I can't take it on, she'll refer them to someone else. She'll do all the communication with that person and we split the profits 50-50. So she's got an incentive to just make more money and um, build this, um, you know, job for her. And I also give her 10% of any sale that comes over. So some months she makes a, a nice amount of money. Um, and it's, it's a good incentive because the, the base price that I'm paying her which she's she's happy to do in it you know it works for both of us it's not that much really for the amount of work but having that extra incentive to refer projects is great for her because she's like yeah, yeah I can make <laughs> I can make more um yeah it's good <laughs> so one thing you and I and I didn't include this in our questions so if you don't want to okay. talk about this you don't have no, to it's fine so you know how a, a lot of people don't think about affiliate marketing um, so you having a sponsor. So sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these people are not podcasters. Jason is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, what the affiliate marketing is, is how I've used it is somebody has a conference and maybe it's an online conference. If you get somebody, you paid for your ticket. If you get somebody mm -hmm. else to pay for a ticket, then you get your ticket paid for. And then anybody else, you're getting half of that a lot of times affiliates are 50 percent or really or 30 percent or something you know you're getting a part of that so it mm -hmm. really incentivizes you and again you know people have talked about already not having all their eggs in one basket and that's a way i know you've done that well because you've mm -hmm. you've done affiliate marketing meaning you become a representative for that conference or for that brand and mm -hmm. now you get a piece of something either they're a sponsor and they give you money for every episode or mm -hmm. even just as a designer if you have a, it's a good way of having if you do have a big following or it's something that you're thinking about doing is utilizing that 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 community right that mm -hmm. and if, if you don't necessarily have your own Facebook community or your own whatever um, just the following you have on Twitter or the following you have on dribble or the following you have on wherever you can actually use that because some you want to talk to them a little bit because that's another that's yeah, an aspect yeah, you've sure. really done well um so basically with with affiliate marketing what you can do is you can approach companies that have um a product and uh, some of them have like public affiliate schemes so you can just go on their website and sign up to them so a lot of font libraries and stuff like this just scroll down there's a link like affiliates you sign up you register for it and um the way that it works these companies most companies have an affiliate scheme they will give you a link and then if someone clicks through that you make a sale you get a, a percentage of that sale mm -hmm. um so when you when you have an audience um you can um you would say share something that you would already share anyway so right. for example um design cuts always have these really good font bundles if i share my link um i get 20 percent of every sale so some months i think last week i shared a link and i made like 200 pound in one day and, um, <laughs> yeah that's awesome yeah, just it, it i mean it's 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 a passive income um mm you 
if, if you build up these relationships with different companies, um, you, can, you can make money just by simply sharing or promoting something that you would already um, promote. So probably the most successful one that I've had, um, Chris Doe and the Future Guys, they did a tour, a European tour, and um, the I know the guys that were setting up the London event, and I pushed them, said, I can help promote this, but do you have an affiliate link? And um, they gave me 40%. <laughs> and the tickets were a couple of hundred pounds. And I sold like 15 tickets. I sold, I sold a quarter of the tickets for the um, event. And that was a couple of grand. That's um, awesome. That was really good. But that, I mean, that, that's an example. Like literally just getting a link, building these relationships, um, sharing them out there you can make a nice amount of money sometimes like probably a minimum I probably make a minimum of 200 pounds a month um, but it's not it, just like you said it's not something that you wouldn't already promote but it's I would, that, I would promote it already exactly so, but you just you took the chance to ask hey do you have an affiliate link yeah it's no like just so that everyone knows um, the company that has it, they still make the sale. As a, um, a customer, they still pay the same amount of money. You're just this middleman that is helping both sides. You know, it's you're marketing. making it to people that want it. Yeah, but I mean, no one's losing out. No. You know, it's just, literally, you're just acting as a middleman. And um, I watched a video yesterday with Pat Blinn, this guy that mm. um, does these videos for Tesla. And Tesla cars are like 100 thousand dollars plus and he gets commission every time he sells one so he does all these um, videos and stuff about tesla and people because they trust him they use his code and he makes several hundred dollars per sale yeah i love pat Flint. People... <laughs> yeah yeah he has a passive income um smart passive income i think it's yeah, his podcast yeah, yeah. And i'm a big has... fan of pat i met him last year and i'm yeah really lucky to have met him <laughs> oh yeah you are I really like him also. I've followed him for many years. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's it's that you've built trust with people mm -hmm. that, and that you have a conversation with them. Even if it's on Twitter and it's just one-sided, you still are having a conversation. You're still there. Now, in the community, I know it's not always one-sided, mm -hmm. but just so people know, you're talking some big names are in the community and very active in the community. Von Glitschka, yeah. who, yeah. who is an amazing illustrator and designer, uh, David Breyer, those are people who are very active in the community. And mm -hmm. I'm just always kind of like blown away that, and you know, they're sharing, people are sharing work. So it's a uh, safe, even though there's 4,000 people in there, um, it does feel like a, a good, safe community to have some growth, I think. Yeah, I would say with, um, with Facebook, there's a lot of type of communities and um, you can have public communities or closed communities. And um, with, with the group I'm building, uh, what's been really hard and what was a real challenge from day one was maintaining the, the quality of the group. I, if anyone's ever spent any time on any Facebook communities, most of them are really bad. And um, being totally honest, I understand how they can be bad. And if I wasn't moderating it on a daily basis, it would the group would become exactly the same way. Um, but I've been experimenting with different things and trying different things and just using the tools that are there to control it and um, so there's an approval process for people that come in and um, it's kind of like a filter mm -hmm. I've got I've basically filtered everything so if people are coming in they have to answer two questions now they just need to tell me who they are and what their portfolio is and there's a high volume of people out there that just don't fill that information out um, if they give rubbish answers, I just don't let them in. Like some, you get some people that just put, just put, okay, okay. It's like, why? <laughs> um, but yeah, with, with Facebook, I, it's been a real eye, eye opener. Um, I don't want to sound horrible, but there are some weird people in, <laughs> in the world and uh, you need these filtration systems. So yeah, first of all, you need to actually get into the group. So there's, um, I think it's like 4,200 people in there now, but there's about three and a half 
maybe nearly 4,000 people pending. Most of those probably won't get in. They're people that have not answered the questions or have given strange answers, but I don't want to just, you know, mm. say no. So I've kind of left it there to go through, but it just keeps growing and growing. It's, um, but it, hard. it's hard. It's harder to have the closed group and accept everybody in. But you've found that that is a critical yeah, part of its growth. You have to do that because right. um, a lot of these big groups, they have all these big names, all these same people. But one of the problems is once you get, you know, a couple of rubbish posts or work that's really bad or just stupid conversations, people don't want to associate with that. Mm. So um, if, if, like I've I've had it, you know. Like I I uh, for a couple of a couple of posts, I let them in. I get people complaining that the quality of the post is not good. And it's like you have no idea how much stuff that you're not seeing. Right. Like, um. I, I I approve the post. So, yeah, you're having to moderate what's coming in. Yeah. So, right. Um. Yeah. So most groups they let everything in, but I found with logo design, um, it's it's high risk for Fiverr type posts, spammy links, mm. people just drop links and stuff like that. Even um, even the big names, <laughs> even the people that you admire, they drop affiliate links and stuff. And um, yeah, you, I try to control that because. Um, it just becomes no fun, you know, people don't want to see that. So I have this whole filtration system so that everything in there is good and I, I moderate it, I check it on a daily basis just to make sure that everything is good. Um, if I see like how it, many times daily? It's just throughout the day. <laughs> Multiple times? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Because uh, I, I mean, I tend to be a little bit addicted to my phone so every time I uh, check it I, there's something happening so I, I check it but one expected thing from having a community is that it's not all good stuff mm -hmm. um, you'd be surprised that when you put um, several thousand designers in a room together people start fighting complaining um, yeah it's been <laughs> I've had some proper full-on Bites with swearing and stuff and had to beat people but you know just uh, moderating it checking it on a daily basis and just working through that it, it becomes you know a, a really great group and that's one of the reasons why it's growing and um, mm -hmm. recently um, like through combination of doing the podcast so on, on the podcast I interviewed Will Patterson we got to know each other really well He's in the group. He came in, he saw something, he did a video about it. And at the beginning, he mentioned the community and that just, you know, flooded in more really good mm. people. Um, so maintaining the group and keeping a high quality because there's no other decent logo design group out there. Right. It's growing really fast. Um, um, yeah, you said 10 months, right? 10 months, yeah. We're not even at a year yet. And so uh, it's Joey's in the Joey's in the group and she says it's been very informative and entertaining. So she's in Hawaii. Um, we talked, Oh, I mean, we're out of time again and we didn't get through the first three <laughs> questions. We still didn't get to this stuff. So Ian, we're just going to have to come back and do it again. Yeah, no worries. It's fine. Um, but we did, we did get a lot. So one of the things I definitely want to cover next time is what your pitches look like because a lot of, one of the things, and I don't know if we talked about this last time or if we talked about it we after. Did it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. we did. <laughs> so, but one of the things I thought was really interesting is that you are working with companies all over the world so i was like oh, are you meeting with them like skyping with them are you doing Not something all by email pretty much so then you're you're making this email. pitch you know you're uh, and we talked about the pitch deck a little bit but i definitely want to get into that next time okay. um because i think that that is really a hindrance i think some for me i am a visual person so um, when I talk to people, I really like to see them. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm fine on the phone sometimes, but I like to be able to see your eyes, see mm -hmm. where you're looking or if you're paying attention to me or not really that. Cause I, I mean, usually if you're doing a video uh -huh. chat, you're paying uh -huh. attention, but, uh -huh. um, but you know, if, if you're like when you pause, if you're just thinking about something or did your cat just run across your computer <laughs> or something, so I really like that. So I, that is a crutch for me. So I can really tell when I'm doing a podcast and I'm not using video, if we turn the video off so that the sound gets mm -hmm. better or whatever, or the internet quality is better. 
I really find that harder. That's more difficult for me. So for you, your communication must be, it, uh, I love this. I can't wait to dig into this because the communication, just be able to send things over an email and through your pitch deck, you must be explaining things in a way that um, has confidence, right? The words you're using, but mm -hmm. it's also explaining why. I know last week um, <laughs> I had um, I sent over some uh, logos to the client and uh, they were they was happy with two and then suddenly they came back and said I've had a conversation with my husband and uh, <laughs> we don't like any of them and <laughs> um, I sent them an email and then they came back and said we're going to go with this one <laughs> and done paid. <laughs> but you had talked I've about become, it. I think I've become really good at like just destroying any um, any of those. Like I, I had a, a call with a client a few weeks back. I had a similar uh, conversation. They started to say something like, we started to show our friends and we think it's a little bit boring and I shot them down and... Because you went back to goals, them. right? The well, goals. Yeah, I mean, like everything is about goals and um, also... Um, I, in that particular instance, I started to make it very clear that the problem with asking people for feedback is that they're not necessarily aware of what the goals are. And with this, we're designing a logo that needs to be versatile. Um, I, I just go back to the goals and um, I kind of stand my ground and say, you know, look, I'm really confident that this is the right solution. But if you'd like me to look at alternative, like, I'm happy to do that. But I think it's a mistake. You know, I would say something like that, just quite firm because I, you know, when I put something together and um, I've worked on it, I do feel confident what, what I've done is the solution and they come to me as the expert. So I will talk to them like I'm talking to you now. <laughs> exactly. So, but I think that there, I think just with everything, and I think that's why your story is so inspiring because that confidence wasn't necessarily always there. No, it's it's come through. Um, it's come through from time, and I I know running because I'm focused so much on Lego design for the last few years, mm -hmm. and I I've read all of the books, and you know just just from the community alone, there's there's people in there that have way more years experience than than I do, um, you know, and I'm kind of like still a, a learner in comparison to some people, but having all these different places to learn from I, I do like I am confident that I know what I'm talking about so when someone starts to say these things um, when I first started out you kind of just do what they ask you to mm -hmm. because you don't want to disappoint the client but it's important to remember that it's a level playing field mm -hmm. you're on the same level as them so if they come with you with these things it's okay to say no you're wrong I, if I ha I've had people say, um, I, I, like I have one guy, uh, it was actually the uh, email. <laughs> he came back to me maybe a week after it was approved and said, hey, Ian, I just want it to be a circle. And I told him that's a mistake because there are so many brands out there that are already a circle. I can give you lots of different examples taking away the, like literally it's a circle with like an arrow going in, taking away that, that V, it's, that's the thing that makes it identifiable. And I just had this conversation where I explained the reason why it needed to be there. And he just said, oh, okay, I'll go with it. <laughs> I think you have to be confident about your work and stand your ground. That, that's, what, um, that's what these agencies do. That's the reason mm -hmm. why their work is good. You know, the, like the, 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 the main difference between um, someone that's just straight out of university and someone that's been doing it for years is that the person that's been doing it for years has gained enough authority to say, no, you're wrong, we're not doing that, in so many words. Right. So I, I just, uh, Matt said it very good. It's great to remember the human side of designers, that we're all yeah. facing battles and struggles. It's mm -hmm. easy to see the great art posted and forget there are struggles behind, behind the scenes for all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just love that part of your story. And I'm so thankful that we went over last time so much that we had a whole, we could have still, still yeah, recorded. Yeah. But I'm really glad 
because there were a ton of people that stayed last time that heard a lot of what we've been talking about today. I mean, definitely we've added some new things, but I really am. I'm, I just want to continue to encourage you just to continue to tell that story because mm -hmm. I do think as the chat was going on, people were like, Oh my goodness, I'm there too, Ian. Um, I struggle with that also. Mm -hmm. you, uh, Jason said he was also in the uh, cognitive therapy. That's the kind of cognitive therapy. Or that's the kind it's, of therapy. You know, it's more common than what people think. Now I've started talking about it. People come to me that I've known for years and said, Ian, I've got depression and I'm going for this. So if, if you are watching this and you, there are, you know, you have dark times or whatever, or struggles, it's okay. Just, um, go like therapist is not lying down in a bed and going, they just explain how things work and how you can solve it and you know i'm sat down doing a live feed now fairly comfortably and you know just two three years ago that wouldn't have been the case so it's worth it's worth going for the help and it's worth knowing that there is a solution for these things I also like the 80 year old Ian inside yeah, coming book. back. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I want like, to write a book called the 80 year old time, <laughs> something like that, you know, write yeah. a book about it. Like this old, because like the, the concept of the time travel is once you've gone back and changed it, you forget everything and you can't remember the future because it's gone. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so yeah, I believe that I'm a time traveler. I love that. I love, I, I love that you're also okay with failing. Like you said, what's the worst that could happen is that I freak out and I turn the video off. I mean, like, right. like, like face it in a hundred years time, none of us is going to be here. So, <laughs> you know, just do the thing that you need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think it's better to do it uh, and fail than to regret never even trying. At least mm -hmm. if once you tried, you know, maybe it would go okay. <laughs> what if it goes well? What if you do, you know, that, that interview with that person and it goes well and then you get invited to another one and that one goes well? Mm. You know, maybe it would be a, you know, the compound effect and the small dominoes to start knocking down the bigger ones. Like, right. think about what if the good thing happens. Right. If it goes wrong, he, he, does it really matter? Not really. No one, I don't think anyone's, like, would you judge me if I had a panic attack now and started crying and run out? You probably not. You're just, it would be embarrassing, but you no, just, I would just feel oh, terrible for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it wouldn't be. I I would not you want you to be embarrassed. No. So if you think about, you know, that person as someone else, what would you think about them? It's never what. It's never no. what, what you're thinking in your head. So you just. I just think you just need to do it. And the more you do these things, the better you get. And yeah. it's that curve, that curve, that arc I was talking about, the, the more you do them, the smaller it gets. And then you just get to a point, I hope, where it just levels out and you just don't have, um, you don't even think about that fear. Like the eating the water, I don't even think about it anymore. Um, <laughs> and I'm hoping it will be the same with, um, public speaking presentations. I'm getting like that with podcasting now, which is really exciting because I can, I think the next season I can inject a little bit of my own personality because mm -hmm. um, it's been very robotic up until now. Um, just doing things like these videos, like last week I had this guy come over and um, he recorded like two hours worth of questions and answers and he's going to edit this video together. Um, I've never done anything like that. So I'm curious to see if that's going to start a new wave of um, video interviews. I don't know yeah. where it's going to end up, but my, one of my, like my long-term goal is to be someone like um, Michael Beirut and doing all these talks and stuff like that. And five years ago, I thought that was impossible, but this year or this last year, I'm on panels with Debbie Millman and, Alina wow. Wheeler and Bill Gardner and I'm speaking with my idols on you know a level, level playing ground like David Airy I gave him some advice and he took it on board and he asked me questions and it's like this is cool we've got this two-way you know we're actually friends you know it's exciting mm -hmm. they're no longer people that 
I, I used to look up to these people and they were on like pedestals and they're like up there somewhere. And now um, I'm on the same. You see them as colleagues, as, as. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they never, I think the, the important thing is they never were up there. Right, they were always right. at the same level. Um, Cause I know people that have just started out that are like 18. If they write a really good article, it will go viral. It will get shared. If you reach out to Aaron Draplin, you know, like Mark Hirons, I know that you know him. He's mm -hmm. what, like, when he was 18, he interviewed Aaron Draplin because he sent him an email. He interviewed Paula Cher a couple of months back. I can't even get her on, but literally he met her at this event. He gave her a badge and then he sent an email saying, oh, I'm the guy that gave you the badge. And he doesn't have a big audience or anything, but he's in, he interviewed Paula Cher. But I think it'll, that's where relationships and you having conversations instead of having these um, concerts, you know, it's instead of just like, ah, so excited. Yeah, you do one at a time. Like, I, right. I think that, that's like everything that I built. Now it's obviously this great big thing that looks impossible to build, but that's been like talking with maybe two or three people every single day for the last five years. Mm. That's how you build a community. You talk with people and their right. people are easy to find online. Like if you want to find people that are interested in logo design, go to Pentagram's Facebook, no Twitter feed and see who's liking, commenting and, and replying mm -hmm. and start replying to them, talking with them, asking questions, interacting with people. I think that's, that's the other key works. is that <laughs> you ask good questions and it's not, again, it's not about you. You're, you just are trying to build something and that, yeah. that a lot of people can benefit from. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of you, Ian, just for you being so bold um, and just being able to share because a lot of people just wouldn't share this mm -hmm. part of. So I can't wait for the new season where you in inject. Doc said he's definitely cu curious about how to better inject more of his self in his work. And I think a lot of people really do hold back. And I know next week we have <laughs> Scotty Russell on the podcast on Design Recharge. And he really did hold back in the beginning of his podcast. He really kept it definitely... Um, he was trying to please too many people instead of pleasing mm -hmm. himself. And I feel like you've done a really good job at saying, Hey, what would the 80 year old Ian say? Yeah. I'm just going to please, <laughs> I'm going to do this and I'm going to please Ian. It's more and make so I don't regret, you know, right. you know, now I have my podcast and I'm hoping that it gets featured in computer arts magazine because they tweeted and um, they, they tweeted something out on their page saying, what's your favorite podcast? And people have been replying to that, I would mind. So I'm hoping it gets featured in that, but yeah, it's cool. Yeah. You know, a few years ago is something that I was terrified of doing. Now I've done it. And Bill Patterson mentioned it on his video, you know, how yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and Anne said, Ian, you're amazing too. You're getting a ton of great feedback mm -hmm. from on my end also. So next week, just so you guys know, we do have Scotty Russell on the podcast who does Perspective Collective and Perspective Podcast. And so I definitely want you guys to check that out as well. So a lot of podcasters, I guess, the next three weeks, you and then the next two weeks are podcasters. Mm -hmm. But there are also designers or d creatives that are in the industry that are, are also doing all kinds of different things, uh -huh. just like Ian. So Ian, thank you for sharing so much. And I want to make sure everybody can connect with you. So I have some of the links from last time, and then I will be adding some of the show notes from this time. So people can always contact you for um, logos. Uh, you, they can see what your business kind of looks like at logogeek.uk. And that's L-O-G-O-G-E-E-K.uk. And I'm just going to paste so much to do on that. There's so much I still want to do, but that's where I am at the moment. <laughs> that's okay. Mine, mine as well. I'm, I'm taking July and I'm going to work on my website, but then they can also follow you on Instagram at logo geek. They can, um, add, they can be asked, just make sure you answer all the questions for the Facebook yeah, group. Um, it doesn't need to be long answers. Just give some kind of like, just briefly introduce yourself. It, I, I generally let most people in that give, um, reasonable answers. Don't say, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, 
on Twitter, logo underscore geek and mm -hmm. Facebook logo geek. And then you can also follow along on his design blog. So at logo geek, blah, logo geek dot UK slash logo hyphen design hyphen blog. I think if you go logo geek, uh, logo geek dot UK forward slash blog, it actually redirects to that anyway. Okay, great. Even better. It's a mouthful, I think, but they can also um, check out your uh, podcast. You can find it on SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Um, and it's just Logo Geek. Or, or you can go to logogeek.uk uh, slash Google, podcast. Just Google Logo Geek and you'll find everything. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Ian. Thank You're you for welcome. giving us time again. And <laughs> I've taken lots of notes at the top. <laughs> but there again, we have lots of questions that we haven't gotten answered, but we will. And I'm, I am going to ask you that pitch deck thing because I do think there is something I am so impressed that you're able to do as many as you want to do. You know, you can turn mm -hmm. them over in, in a quick amount of time. But mm -hmm. I think that that also has built confidence and, yeah. and how you've communicated. You have honed in how you've done it. So now you can... Um, you can yeah, I can, it's probably worth going through like the, the whole process because... Um, Everything is templated, my mm -hmm. emails, my system. I just literally just followed through from start to end, money, money in. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a, a product <laughs> you could sell, <laughs> Ian. That, that sounds like something you could package and sell. I think people, especially people starting out, but I also think just even as an established business, just to see what else you're able to do, because I think mm -hmm. one of the things that's really impressive is that you do you have had people from all over, but I think that mm -hmm. it's because you've built this group of people from all over the world. So yeah, anyway, super, super mm -hmm. impressed. All right. Well, I'm going to sign off. We'll see you guys next week with Scotty Russell.